Imagine you're lost in the forest with your camping gear, but no more fuel. You can't run your generator, your stove, or your lamp. What are you going to do? In a large-scale application, extracting biofuel from algae can be complicated, time-consuming, and expensive. But it's super handy to have when you're lost in the forest. Algae is comprised of three main components. Carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids, or natural oils. Microalgae, in particular, has a high oil content and rapid biomass production, making it perfect for use in biofuel. So step number one was to collect some algae. I collected pond algae from a pond that I have near my house. Um, pond algae has the highest oil content, so I have to harvest less algae to get more biofuel. Step number two is going to be separating the oil from the algae. When algae grows, it absorbs sunlight and converts it to energy. And some of the energy is stored in the form of oil. In order to make biodiesel, we're going to need to separate the oil from the algae. Commercially, this is usually done by using high amounts of pressure or sound waves in order to crush the walls that hold in the oil within the algae. Instead, because we don't have that technology, we could either use a garlic press to actually physically squish the algae and remove the oil from it, or use a blender to break it down, and then once it settles, the oil will come to the top. I started out with a garlic press and it didn't go that well, so instead I'm going to use a blender to break it down. Since you're not going to have a blender in the wild, you can either use sticks and stones to squish down the algae or your hands to create a really mixed up, mushed uh, solution and then you can let it settle and the oil will settle to the top. So as your blended mixture is settling off to the side, you're now going to make what's called lye. Traditionally, sodium hydroxide is used to do a process called transesferication. Um, which separates the uh, mixture or the oil into glycerin and actual biodiesel, so it's usable. The problem is there's no way to get sodium hydroxide out in nature, so we're going to use the second best alternative, which is potassium hydroxide, which is commonly known as lye. Again, this is really hard to get in nature, but we're going to be able to make it using some gravel, some wood ashes, and some water. So in order to make your lye, you're going to start with a cup. This could be anything, a piece of cloth or anything you have, and I've punched some holes in the bottom. Then I'm gonna add a little layer of gravel. This is gonna stop the ashes from actually traveling through with the water. On top of the gravel, you're gonna add some wood ashes. Hardwood is the best, um, softwoods like pine is not usually um, going to produce the best product, but whatever you have in the forest is what you're going to be able to use. So I have a mason jar here. You could pour this into anything. I'm going to put it on top and then I'm going to pour through some water. This is going to create lye water. Um, although it's not ideal because it's not a solid that you're going to mix into your oil, it's the best you're going to have. Again, the best to use is rainwater, not actual treated water, um, because it'll interfere less with the process. And now you're going to repeat this process of putting the water through the red cup into the mason jar multiple times, and that'll produce lye water, which you're going to use in the next transfestoration process. So the final step of creating your awesome biodiesel is going to be to take the oil that you've separated out of the algae, you're going to take some of your wonderful lye water, which stands in for your potassium hydroxide, I've already poured some in there, and you're going to take alcohol. Um, usually they use methanol in 
the traditional commercial way of making biodiesel, but pretty much anything will stand in. I'm going to use rubbing alcohol. You could also use some wonderful drinking alcohol that you take along for the weekend, or you could use anything that's alcohol based out of your first aid kit. So I'm going to add some of this. Potassium uh, hydroxide acts as a catalyst in the reaction, uh, speeding it up. And it's going to separate glycerol from the methanol ester, which is the fancy name for uh, biodiesel. So basically you're going to be left with some great glycerol, which is like soap, and your biodiesel. You're going to separate the two, and then you can run your lamp, stove, and generator. So on the side here, you can see that we actually have the clear, chunky glycerol that's forming. And in the center, you have your biodiesel. So before we actually use our awesome biodiesel, we need to know exactly why it works. Here we see the atomic structure of regular diesel. This is what you would use in cars or trucks. As you can see, it's a really long hydrocarbon chain. And this is the atomic structure of biodiesel. As you can see, it is very similar to the structure of regular diesel, except for the ester functional group drawn in green at the very end. The close similarity between diesel and biodiesel allows biodiesel to be used in regular engines, meaning that if I really wanted to, I could run any diesel engine with biofuel without making any modifications. This is what makes biofuel such a promising environmentally friendly fuel source. The first engines ever built were actually run on vegetable oil, which is basically the first biofuel ever used. However, as you can see, a single molecule of vegetable oil is similar in structure to biofuel, but much larger. This caused the vegetable oil to become a gel-like substance at freezing temperatures, causing the engines not to run. So they had to come up with a different alternative, which would allow the engine to run at cold temperatures. And that is how they found diesel. Next comes my favorite part of the project. It's when I get to play with fire. So I went to the local gas station and I picked up some dyed diesel. This is the regular stuff you would use in construction equipment or a diesel engine truck. As you can see, I put a fabric wick inside a small amount of diesel and lit it on fire. And the diesel is fueling the flame like it would in a kerosene lamp. The interesting part about diesel is that unlike gas, with which combusts when exposed to a small amount of heat, which is the reason you can't have cigarettes or any sources of flame around a gas station, diesel requires a high heat, high pressure environment in order to combust. And this is why diesel engines are different than gas powered engines. And we're going to use the burning diesel here as a reference to see how our biodiesel works compared to it. Here I have the exact same setup as before, except this time with our homemade biodiesel. Thinking back to the atomic structures we discussed before, both diesel and biodiesel have very similar structures, meaning that they should burn in similar ways. And they do, as you can see here, meaning that we have successfully made homemade biodiesel from algae. So now you must be thinking, well, if it's so easy to make biofuel, why isn't our main fuel source right now? Well, there's some pros and cons to algae biofuel, as well as some things that need to happen in order for it to become our major fuel source. First off, for the pros, it's a renewable resource. Algae absorbs CO2, making it a zero emissions process, since it absorbs what it expels when it's used in cars. 100% of the byproducts, which is glycerol, have other applications. It's accessible all over the world, meaning any country can grow it. Algae itself is also an inexpensive source, although the manufacturing may be more expensive. Currently, it is very expensive to make, which is a con. The infrastructure also does not exist for large-scale production. It is very time-consuming to make currently. Scientists have yet to determine if it's a sustainable source because growing the fuel could actually take more energy than it expels when it's running a car. Most car engines are also made for petroleum gas, not diesel. So in order for biofuel to become our major fuel source, a couple steps will need to happen. First, the technology involved in the manufacturing process needs to be improved. More land space will need to be allocated to grow and manufacture the biofuel. 
the cost of manufacturing the fuel will need to become lower in order to compete with fossil fuels and make it more appealing to the masses. And all engines will need to be converted in order to actually use the fuel. Hot, hot, I heard